Hello, Buzzkillers. It's me. It's Professor Buzzkill. You know, I love it when we're able to revisit shows and revisit issues that we've done in the past. We did a Watergate show a couple of years ago about all the myths involving Watergate. Two of the biggest ones are my favorite myths, the one I like busting the most. The first was that Woodward and Bernstein were individual heroes, did it all themselves, and were so almost solely responsible, the two of them, the duo was responsible, like Batman and Robin, for bringing down the Nixon administration. But the second one, perhaps a bigger one, and more important for American history generally, is that Woodward and Bernstein, the Washington Post, and the Watergate era sort of invented modern investigative journalism for, at least for the United States. And ever since then, we've had investigative journalists crawling around all over everywhere. And of course, as I said on my show, that's not true. But fortunately for you, we have actual genuine experts here who've done tremendous research into this uh, for years and who are here to talk about it. And more importantly, there's a specific issue of the important journal, American Journalism, con that just came out in this fall about specifically this problem. And it includes not only uh, academic articles, but interviews with important uh, people involved in Watergate and also with important journalists. But anyway, I'm talking too much. I need to introduce you to two important academics who are involved in, in this. The first is Dr. Nicholas Hirschhorn. Dr. Nur Hershon, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And the second one is Dr. Gerard Lenoska. Thanks for having me on the show, Professor. Thank you for having me. Well, I looked over what you sent to, uh, sent to me, Dr. Hershon, about this and sent me the, the stuff that's in the journal. And I looked at the issue of the journal. It's absolutely fascinating. Unput downable for a historian like me, because not only does it have the history articles and this stuff from communications professors, but it has all those important interviews and, and, and roundtables and things with people involved, John Dean and other people involved in Watergate, but also journalists. Can you tell us a little bit about this myth that, or set up the sort of background to this myth that Woodward and Bernstein created this type of journalistic work? Sure. Well, I should mention that American Journalism, our academic journal, is a peer-reviewed journal put out by the American Journalism Historians Association, one of mm -hmm. the largest groups in the world of journalism historians. And we figured that with the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in happening this year, we would want to look into all of these myths about what happened in Watergate and about the history of investigative journalism in general in the United States. We want to pay tribute to the work that, for example, Woodward and Bernstein, Woodward and Bernstein did with the Washington Post in reporting on the Watergate scandal, but also acknowledge that there was a whole trail of people before them who were setting the stage for this kind of important work, mm -hmm. and there have been people who've come after them. Um, so some of those myths of Watergate is that Woodward and Bernstein alone were the ones who took down President Nixon, uh, that the Washington Post, if it had not existed, if it was not doing this reporting, that Nixon would have remained in office and would have never been forced to resign with the threat of impeachment looming. In fact, there were lots of other reporters who were involved in that process. Um, there were lots of other parties in what we call an ecosystem of journalists, investigators, prosecutors, police politicians and this ecosystem working in concert with journalists to bring out the truth. So maybe sometimes mm -hmm. the Washington Post would report something for the first time that would give a sense of the FBI or some other sort of investigative agency that there is something to report here to look into further, but that also sometimes the Washington Post was benefiting from elected officials then amplifying the reporting that they were doing. Right. And and as, as I said on my show, and, and, and as I think Professor Campbell, William Campbell, sort of the dean of this uh, area of studies. Joseph Campbell. Uh, sorry, Professor Joseph Campbell said uh, sort of, he's sort of the dean of, the, of this area of journalistic history is, uh, and I didn't mean that in a John Dean relative sense. I just, you know, uh, hundreds of people were involved in uncovering the Watergate crimes and bringing about the, bringing those people who were involved to heal. Yes. I mean, for this special issue, as you mentioned, I interviewed John Dean, who was the White House counsel under President Nixon. I also interviewed Dwight Chapin, who was Nixon's appointment mm -hmm. secretary during Watergate. Both of those men spent time in prison for their involvement in the scandal. We also have an essay in the special issue from Gordon Freeman, who was a staff assistant on the Senate Watergate Committee that investigated Nixon's crimes. And in doing all of this work, you start to see that there's an investigative ecosystem that's at play. There were hundreds of people involved from prosecutors and police and journalists and elected officials who work in coordination in order to uncover corruption. 
And this is a kind of some a trend that we see happen whenever there is a government investigation. We've seen it happen in the most recent Donald Trump impeachments. And mm -hmm. there's some line that we draw there in the academic journal. I did an interview through email with Adam Schiff who was the lead impeachment manager in one of Donald Trump's trials. And there's a lot of other thoughts in the in the journal from other people relating to other issues throughout American history, where journalists rely on access to public records, and those public records would not be created if not for prosecutors demanding them, writing them up, and then making them available to a journalist. And then again, a journalist may do a lot of great research, but it will go nowhere. It won't necessarily make an impact unless elected officials and courts and police and prosecutors then come in and say, we are going to take action based on this. You know, Woodward and Bernstein could have just written these stories and then OK, so everyone just kind of shrugs and says mm. Nixon did this stuff. It doesn't really matter. But obviously there were other people who said, we're going to pick up on this and amplify that message. And that's one of the biggest myths of Watergate, that it was just two men who we see in the movie, All the President's Men, <laughs> working quietly by themselves when everyone doesn't believe in them and they don't have any sort of support. And yet we know that there were a lot of other people, including other people in The Washington Post and editors like Leonard Downey Jr. and mm. obviously Ben Bradley and lots of other people who were supporting their work. And you call this an ecosystem. And I think that's a great term. Is that is that something that, that you use in your field when when there's something that this this not only diverse but is also working together almost like a throbbing or major organism frankly it's a term that i hadn't really been introduced to until i was reading this piece by gordon freeman the staff assistant for the senate watergate committee oh right okay who, yeah and he wrote this essay for us where he described all of his work and he said you know i worked with politicians on this and i saw the way that we were picking up on things that were reported in the news media. And he also then is thinking about what happens in more modern contexts yeah. of when some of the reporting, for example, on President Trump might not generate the same amount of government action and investigation. And there might be less of a, a of a bipartisan effort to investigate these things. Yeah, but that idea of an investigative ecosystem, and I think it's so true in everything that we do as a reporter. I mean, I used to be mm. a reporter for the New York Daily News, and if I was reporting on some sort of a problem in a community, of course, you know, I want to get it out there to the public, but I was hoping that decision makers, people who would actually have the ability to intervene, would see this act on it and have hearings. And a few times those sorts of things happen. So I think it's important to acknowledge that journalists are always going to rely in a democracy on elected officials and others. Well, I'm going to steal that idea of ecosystem because it also helps for, in my own research. I'm, I'm working on Churchill and, and Second World War. It helps explain how my argument is, of course, Churchill has given this the status of the hero winning the war, winning the Battle of Britain all on his own, the savior of Western civilization. And of course, that's just literally not true. There are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people, and they're working in that sort of kind of ecosystem. So I will have to ask you after the show for more details on, on who I should acknowledge in my book about this. But uh, I just think it's a great way to conceptualize that complicated things usually have to be done by very large, complicated groups of people. Um, who have different levels of authority to get that information, right? Journalists have the morality of saying, we are the fourth estate and we are going to be the ones mm -hmm. to uncover this information. But journalists don't really have special access sometimes to information that a prosecutor or an elected official can subpoena somebody and require them to testify about something that a journalist can only really knock on the door or make a phone call. And that person could say, go away. And that's the end of the yeah, story. But, right. uh, but, you know, but elected officials have a lot more power. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a history podcast. And I love the fact that your journal issue is about not, not only the Watergate thing, but about the, the roots of a lot of this thing, a lot of this investigative journalism. So Dr. Lenoska, your article, Behold the wicked abominations that they do, the 19th century roots of the evidentiary approach in American investigative journalism not only opens the, the journal issue, but is extremely important. And before, but before we take another step, please tell me the origins of that great quote, behold the wicked abominations that they do. I'm going to use it every time I look at my son's filthy room. 
Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that. In the in the journal article, uh, we have a phrase in journalism about burying the lead, where you put the most important thing, you know, deep down in the story. And I think uh -huh. it's on page uh, 15 of the journal article. <laughs> I, I want to make sure people got deep into the article before they figured it out. But it is a Bible verse. It comes from the book of Ezekiel. And it is a verse that appears on the flyleaf of one of the key publications that I examined for this article called American Slavery As It Is, Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses. Mm -hmm. And the idea is is that these abolitionist writers are casting their eyes and their light on, you know, what has been called America's original sin, slavery, and exposing the realities of it at a time when those realities weren't necessarily known. And of course, you can argue today that we still don't know them as well as we should. But certainly in that time, there was a lot of mythology around the idea of slavery. Um, mm. the, the company line that the Southern planting class was pushing was really, uh, you know, that this is the the highest and best use of black people. They're in exactly the place they need to be. They're happy and they're doing what they are put here to do. And we treat them well and they're very happy in their in their station. And that's a pretty persistent myth. But the abolitionist writers really want to throw some light on that. And so I love that Bible verse as the title of my article and really as kind of a uh, an exhortation to investigative reporters. You know, we we shed light, we point fingers at things going on in dark corners and say, behold, mm -hmm. look at this stuff going on. Well, when, when you say 19th century, you know, a lot of our, we do a lot of stuff on abolitionists and, th and people like that in the 19th century. In fact, we recently did a show on Lydia Mariah Child, who is an important abolitionist. But what sort of so so our, our listeners will know a lot about early 19th. 19th century, mid 19th century abolitionism. What years are we talking about in terms of this really, those abolitionists starting to really dig into evidence as we would know it today? It really starts early 19th century. And of course, abolition writings go back much further. Mm -hmm. and there are great examples of, as you know, British abolitionists who were doing really interesting stuff in, in 17th century, of course. And there are some some writings sporadically through the 18th century, but I think it really starts to pick up in the early, in the, in the U.S., of course, in the early 19th century. And most of my focus is on the 1830s. I do mm -hmm. look a little bit at that pre-1830 period. But I think in the 1830s, there's really a sort of renewed second wave of abolitionism that is a little bit more uh, radical, tends to be less polemical in nature. Well, I shouldn't say it tends to be less polemical. It's just as polemical as what came before, but it also takes a turn and becomes much more evidence-based and much more concrete in sort of pointing out the realities of slavery as opposed to these sorts of polemics that were based mainly in biblical exegesis and so forth in the, right. in the early part of the 19th century. So I think as time goes on, and particularly as the immediate abolitionists sort of win the battle over the, the gradualists in that group of advocates, the rhetoric becomes much more radical and pointed and concrete and certainly evidence-based, which is what I was really most interested in, sort of thinking about this as a proto form of investigation or investigative reporting. Is there a conscious move that way? Because I know, at least in the late 18th century, in the British context of abolishing the slave trade or attempting to abolish the slave trade, there was a lot in these parliamentary committees, you know, there was a lot of use of evidence, uh, drawings of slaves crammed into sl on slave ship lower decks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a point, uh, there probably isn't, it's probably more gradual than this, but is there a point where journalists start, to, these abolitionists start to say, no, 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 we need to bulk this up with more stuff, not just the moralizing? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's very explicit. It, it does take place gradually. It's not like there's mm -hmm. a light switch that gets turned on. There is a gradual sort of sense that, you know, this strategy of moral suasion can't just be biblical based. And that was really their approach. They wanted to initially try to persuade the the people who were keeping black Americans captive. They wanted to keep them, you know, as property. The abolitionists were really trying to persuade them on the biblical basis and the moral basis that this is a sin. You shouldn't do this. And over time that evolves into, well, that's not really working. And Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so moral suasion starts to become maybe directed a little bit more broadly at a broader American public to say, we need to persuade the American public about really what's going on here and how bad slavery is by shedding light on these things. And so there's a lot of sort of an increasing emphasis in the rhetoric on we really need to shine a light here, we need to expose things, and we need to show what slavery really is. So they start explicitly including affidavits from people who've traveled in the South who've been able to see slavery up close and personal. They, they have affidavits from former slave, you know, slaveholders, people who have, you know, kind of come around because mm -hmm. they're 
people. And they began compiling evidence in other ways using, you know, advertisements in Southern newspapers, for instance, handbills that would circulate where people were trying to track down people who had run away from captivity and so forth. And so that definitely does accelerate, especially after uh, after 1830 with, uh, you know, I think, you know, with um, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, mm. especially. He for- and the, the, his newspaper, The Liberator, is huge for this. It is. But even before The Liberator begins being published, what I think of for purposes of my article as his masterwork is 200 plus page dismantling of the philosophy of colonization, uh, mm-hmm. which is you know, kind of a you know early 19th century idea that abolitionists had that they should free the slaves gradually, but then ship them overseas and get them out of the right. country. And many of the most prominent abolitionists were favor that view, including Garrison. But over time, he became convinced and others became convinced that that was not the right way to go, that it was immoral, and also that it was just going to perpetuate slavery. And so I think it was 1830 when he published this massive book, basically a a pamphlet, but it's really a book attacking colonizationists and, and really demonstrating through their own words, their letters, their newspapers, their pamphlets that they had published, that they really weren't opposed to the idea of slavery at all. And so that was explicitly used as an example for later abolitionists as a way to build a case with evidence against, you know, this practice. Yeah, we should remind the buzzkillers that colonization in this sense means sending former slaves back to Africa to have sort of former slave colonies in Africa from North America. And it's it was it was a popular idea for a, a long time and of course as you say was was ultimately dismantled. Well, I don't want to get too methodological about this, but do these journalists start to say things that ring bells with journalism professors and journalism practitioners in modern times? I mean, do they do do they start saying, you know, we need to start using AP style in our citations? And I mean, you know what I mean? Are, are they saying, well, well, let's, you know, did you get four sources? Did you do this? Did you do that? Were there people, were they really looking at it as a kind of, I don't know, as a kind of a method, methodological innovation? Yeah, I think so. I think you have to be careful about, you know, reading a contemporary practice backward. And so I'm careful here to keep that in mind and to think about this as a form of proto investigative journalism, because in terms of codifying the method of investigative reporting. We don't really see that in textbooks until really the mid 20th century. And that phrase, even the phrase investigative reporting doesn't come into play in the professional discourse until the mid 20th century. But I think one of the other authors in the special issue, Jim O'Coin has, you know, among others, has given us a pretty good definition of what what investigative reporting is, you know, that involves in-depth coverage of important issues of public affairs that are often, you know, either purposely or inadvertently covered up. And when you look back at what the abolitionists are doing, it it certainly kind of checks all those boxes. And they do speak explicitly and purposefully of method. They don't talk necessarily about AP style. <laughs> yeah, that was a joke, Buzzkiller's AP style. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Proto AP style. <laughs> uh, but they do have a real concern that you can see not only in their writings, but because we have preserved corpuses of letters between many of these abolition activists, you can see them talk to each other about these methodological issues and about, I mean, it's not enough to just have rhetoric. It's not enough to just appeal to the sinful nature, you know, to the, uh, you know, the enslavers, but we really have to show what they're doing to that broader population. And we need to do it with sources that are verifiable, that are authentic, that are unimpeachable. And so they really are concerned about not having anonymous sources. Um, there's some discussion of anonymity and the, the fact that that's not going to be enough to persuade people, that they really need to have people whose names are available. And in some of these, in many of these works, in fact, you mentioned Lydia Mariah Child and certainly in Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses, American Slavery as it is, there's this specific appeal to the readers that if you if you need further proof, we'll come on down to 123 Nassau Street and you can look at all the documents. So it, so it, it definitely is ex- explicitly methodological. And I think while you can find examples of what we would call exposés or investigative reporting, you know, earlier in the colonies, going back certainly to America's first newspaper in 1690, those are much more, one-offs is probably not the right word, but they're a little more irregular. Mm-hmm. And I think what the abolitionists do is they build on that practice that begins 
and they make it sort of a systematic method in ways that are very explicit for people who come after them. Now, do they notice, or is it measurable, a difference in the attention that is paid to what they say once they start using the evidentiary approach? Are there do more people write in and say, "Oh no, oh now I see," or or they or do they get more followers? I mean, it may, it may not be. You may, like you say, you usually can't pin something to one cause, but is there a change along those lines? Yeah, it, it is really. That's really hard to disentangle, and, and that certainly goes to that that idea of ecosystem that yeah Nick we're talking about because they're you know they're not the only ones. Certainly, the the abolitionist writers are not the only ones who are sort of advocating. There are people in Congress, for instance, and people in levels of state government and so forth who are sort of carrying the the water as well. So it's hard to disentangle. I I will say that I think American Slavery as it is, Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses, this this book that was put together by Theodore Weld, along with his wife and her sister, is an amazing piece of work. It's Again, it's another 200 plus page pamphlet that was modeled after Garrison's thoughts on colonization. And it's difficult reading. It is exhaustive. And you come away from reading it going, wow, how could people not have been swayed? But, you know, as we know, we're talking about 1830s. This was 1839 when that pamphlet was published. And we don't resolve the question of slavery for decades. Yeah, yeah. If ever. And so a lot of the papers, even northern papers, sort of ignore the work. Or if they mention it, they mention it very briefly. But there are a few examples of newspapers who respond to that and and say exactly what you suggested, which is, well, we sort of knew a little bit of this, but we had no idea the extent to which this was happening right, yeah. before we had this exhausting, exhaustive accounting of it. So I think there was some, you know, certainly some effect there, you know, how much we don't know. Yes, and it's impossible to, to measure. And of course, like you say, it takes a war and a whole lot of other things to, to abolish slavery in this country. Well, it's a good time for us to take a little bit of a sponsorship break. So we'll do that, Buzzkillers, and we'll be back in a moment. Okay, Buzzkillers, we're back with Professors Gerard Lenoska and Nicholas Hershon, who are talking to us about the development of investigative journalism in American history. And not only to destroy the myth, continually destroy the, continue to destroy the myth that Woodward and Bernstein invented it during Watergate, but also to show us the detail and all the things that actually happened. Before we went to on break, we talked about how abolitionists, slavery abolitionists, move from a language of moralizing, talking mainly about the immorality of slavery, to using evidence and as much sort of social scientist da- scientific data as they could gather. And again, I'm using a 20th century term for that to try to convince their readers. So professors, how does this then move throughout the 19th century? Does investigative journalism become a thing? Professor Langosa. Yeah, well, one thing I would say is that there is some mainstream newspaper coverage of slavery and effort to expose the evils of slavery. Some newspaper reporters from New York go down to the South and pose as just regular people or, you know, somehow go undercover incognito to expose the conditions. But this doesn't happen until the 1840s, well after Mm -hmm. the abolitionists kind of set the stage and paved the way by showing how this could be done to really, on a basis of fact and document and evidence, how this could be exposed. And so I think there is you know, it's it's hard to make the, you know, back up the claim, I, I suppose, but interpretation, my historical interpretation is there mm-hmm. is some sort of media agenda setting effect there where what the abolitionist writers are doing, not only in terms of the content, but in terms of method, how they're doing it, rubs off and starts to take off a little bit in mid 19th century mainstream press. And then we do see in newspapers throughout, you know, the the final half of the 19th century where there are these occasional crusades that newspapers put on. We also see investigative books or muckraking books, and this is pre-muckraking period, Mm-hmm. Um, see people like Henry Demarest Lloyd. I was thinking about this quote of his. I haven't yet found a smoking gun document, if you will, that <laughs> we're basing what we've done on, you know, look what these abolitionists did. Let's do the same thing. But we do see where journalists like Henry Demarest Lloyd talk about their method in a way. And so he's writing in that Atlantic Monthly later in the 19th century about monopoly practices. And he's um, oh, trying right. to expose these evils of capitalism. And he says, here is a description of how I did this. He gives an in-depth discussion of his methods and sources. He says, it's been quarried out of official records, and it is a venture in realism in the world of realities. 
that is essentially what the abolitionists did. Um, and they weren't the first to do it, but they certainly established a more systematic way. And then it does kind of roll into the muckraking period in the early 20th century. Some historians have argued there's a bit of a, a lull in the those middle decades of the first half of the 20th century. And I've argued against that. But certainly we see that that practice continues to flourish, if not specifically calling out the abolitionists, certainly building on what they did. Let's remind the buzzkillers, of course, that muckraking was a 19th century, late 19th century term for essentially investigative journalism looking into the, the muck part of society the unhygienic meatpacking industry, all sorts of other things. And it was initially used as a slur against that type of reporting. You know, why are you raking up the muck and making the country look so bad? But the muckrakers themselves, if I'm wrong, professors tell me, they, they sort of took it as a badge of honor and it became sort of something to call yourself with pride or professional pride. I'm a muckraker. And I also would point out that Muck. Sorry, this. Let me just switch it. This now is Professor because we're audio only, so this is Professor Hershon. So we should also point out that we were just talking about the investigative ecosystem, and mm -hmm. when you look at muckrakers in the 20th century, for example, I think about Jacob Rees, who was doing a lot of right, work right. in New York City, where I live. And a lot of his photojournalism, where he was going into squalid tenements and showing the terrible living conditions that people had, and young boys and girls were sleeping up against each other and dirty and all of that. You know, a lot of his work was brought to light by people like Teddy Roosevelt picking up on mm -hmm. it. And then giving uh, Teddy Roosevelt really felt some kinship with some of these muckrakers exposing corruption. And so you need an advocate. You know, a journalist doing yeah. this alone cannot really necessarily get public change. You need someone who's in a position where they have a lot of passion and they're willing to use their bully pulpit, as Teddy Roosevelt would have called it, to reiterate the points that the journalists are making and mm -hmm. keep hammering it until eventually the public outcry is so much that you have to address this concern and make things better. Yeah. And is, is there any sense in which the sort of roughly contemporary uh, development, which is the the rise of the social sciences as an acad uh, acad academic discipline, is that helping? Is that now also part of that eco this new and well, new growing and evolving ecosystem? sociology and, and all that, all those sorts of things? I think certainly the work of all of these investigative journalists is yeah. encouraging academics to look more into living conditions as we get into a new industrial age and we're trying to figure out the working conditions and how that's affecting people, mm -hmm. long working hours, again, tenements and things like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire that happened in New York City. When you have people, you know, young ages being forced to work long hours and all of that. So it's, yes, it's forcing us to examine the conditions in which this is happening. And then journalists keep doing that work and it becomes a cycle. But I think sure. it's also, you know, we're considering that that cycle can stop when there's less support for investigative work, as some are saying is happening in recent decades, as newsroom staffs are shrinking. And there's not as much, you know, maybe political will to follow through on some of the investigative journalism that's being put oh, out right. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that can be very discouraging for journalists. I mean, one of the things that I learned in doing, the, you know, being the editor of this special issue is we have pieces written by current investigative journalists at USA Today, Tampa Bay Times, San Diego Union Tribune, Axios, Houston Chronicle, all writing about why they were inspired to become investigative journalists and different pieces of journalism, books, movies that kind of inspire them to this day. And they are still doing some really terrific work. So the myth Another myth, I know we like to bust myths on the show. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, an, another one of the myths is that, oh, investigative journalism kind of ended and there's not that much being done anymore mm. because of the declining stuff. Now, definitely, it's more difficult. There are challenges to it and there aren't as many people in the newsroom doing it. But there was actually a study done a few years ago that found that the number of investigative stories in newspapers is actually the same or increasing in recent years. And oh, some wow. of that is because you will only find investigative work in print, you don't really yeah. see as yeah, much yeah. investigative work in radio and television journalism. It exists, but there's maybe not the space for it, and certainly at a local level. So that's where a lot of newspaper editors feel we can fill a gap. We can have investigative stories that the big TV networks and radio stations are not going to devote the resources and time to. And then our readers really value that and say, well, there's a reason why I'm paying for this, not just to read about national issues in my local newspaper. I can get that on MSNBC or Fox or CNN or whatever, but the stuff that's happening in my community, 
these are the journalists who are holding powers accountable. Do you think that's also why certain entities like Salon and other groups like that, which sometimes are based around podcasts and stuff like that, are also thriving? Um, you know, I definitely think so. I think things uh -huh. like Bellingcat and a lot of different sorts of uh, Mother Jones, a lot mm -hmm. of different online news outlets and podcasts that do investigations. There's always going to be intrigue and interest in what's happening mm -hmm. behind closed doors and decisions that are being made that affect us, how folks are spending our taxpayer dollars. So all of that is just critical to a democracy and certainly the work of a journalist. And the people who contributed essays to this special issue are those folks who are curious, who are still working every day in an increasingly challenging environment to try to bring out news to a increasingly polarized audience who sometimes mm -hmm. doesn't appreciate what they are emphasizing. And I think in light of all of those difficulties that the modern journalist is facing, it's even more important to recognize them and read them, subscribe to the outlets that they're writing or recording video or audio for, because there's a lot still being done out there. But journalists, like anybody, need some validation sometimes. We need someone to say, really good work there. And, you know, of course, there's only so many Pulitzers you can give out for investigative well, journalism, yeah, yeah. but there's still a lot of great stuff happening in local communities that deserves to be talked about. And Professor Lenosko, apart from the sort of technological changes, podcasting and broadcasting, whatever, is what Professor Hershon just said, is, it, is that ringing any bells about, of, of similar things, similar reactions that people had in the 19th century to the sort of development of evidentiary journalism? Are people happy about it? Wow, that's a really good one. You know, it's one thing that's really difficult to do historically is really get a handle on the reception of media. Uh, yeah. so I'm a former reporter. Nick's a former reporter. And a lot of what uh, media historians do is study how people like them in the past produced things. And uh, we have the leavings of that in great variety, depending on the time period. So it's the evidence is pretty substantial to figure out how people did journalism in the past. How audiences responded to it is uh, more ephemeral and difficult, unless you mm -hmm. can stumble on a diary collection where they just happen to talk about you know, their media use and so forth. And th those things exist there. But I haven't certainly found a, a lot to deal with there. People are talking about their, their sort of response to that. What we can get a, a handle on is some degree of what more contemporary media scholars talk about as meta-journalistic discourse, which is how journalists talk to each other about what they do, and in some cases, how they talk to the public about what they do. And so there's there's a fair bit of that. You know, you can look at textbooks, you can look at starting in the late 19th century, you, you see the establishment of some trade associations and trade journals where there's discussion about techniques and things things like this. And so, but that really accelerates toward the end of the 19th century and into the, especially in the early 20th century, where that starts to flower. And we really get a good sense of that. Not so much in the early 19th century and so forth, do we have a sense of how mm -hmm. audiences were responding or even journalists necessarily. But we do see the work. We do see the, yeah. the spreading and, and increasing over time. And uh, so, you know, we make our sort of imputations from that. But there are there are some parallels, because after all, one of the things that I always complain about in, in the 20th, late 20th century, 21st century, is the rise of the celebrity journalists, the, you know, the, the people who are on TV that are more about, and people listen to them more about their celebrity than about the news, and people listen to it and believe them because they're celebrities. And some of the, but some of the muckrakers became celebrities and people followed them by name. Now, of course, the muckrakers were doing the actual work. They weren't just talking heads. But the rise of the a journalist as someone to, as a profession to point to, seems very interesting to me. Yeah. And that really does take off, you know, starting in the late 19th century. You had some people who were covering the Civil War who became, you know, quite well known. And yeah. uh, you know, certainly toward the turn of the century that happened and journalism was really becoming more of an occupation. And journalists themselves were trying to think of themselves as professionals. And so all these professional trappings came into being. And with the you know, the increased number of, of outlets with the muckrakers in particular, they were writing in these national magazines, which gave them great notoriety beyond yeah. just a, a small circulation area. And so they definitely were able to build a, a brand, if you were, you would think about it in those terms. Um, mm. But um, yeah, they were doing really serious work that was, you know, focused on social ills of the day, you know, and so they reached a quite a large audience. And there you can, you can almost, uh, 
you know, make a further interpretation about the effect on audience because there were substantive, concrete policy changes that came about, at least partly because of what they were doing and the, mm -hmm. the pressure that they were keeping on policymakers. And so, you know, I think there were audiences who were reading this stuff and politicians to some degree responding to that. Well, let's bring it back to Watergate to wrap things up. And, and one of the things that the two of you told me when we were talking about doing this show over email was that there were a number of prominent journalists who were very well known and certainly became very well known later as well, who were investigative journalists in Watergate and doing important things. So let's give them a shout out. Who are some of these people that people, who are some of these journalists that people would know by name and would say, oh, I didn't know she worked on Watergate? Well, the most prominent there is Connie Chung. I had an uh -huh. interview with Connie Chung, who got her start working for the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite in 1971. And she was covering the George McGovern campaign. And McGovern, of course, ran against Nixon in 72, eventually, yeah. yeah. Which was the, you know, the precipice. This is the, what, That's what obviously started, yeah. precipitated the Watergate break-in when the Nixon administration is trying to get information about McGovern. And Connie Chung was, at the beginning of her career, thrust into covering the White House in chaos and even described at one point having a one-on-one -on -one chance meeting with Richard Nixon in the White House where he just happened to be in the other room and she was able to kind of wander over and uh, Nixon allowed her to get through the Secret Service. And the fact that she got her career started in that era then informed a lot of the work that she would do later on and that sort of investigative spirit because People mm -hmm. associate mm -hmm. Connie Chung mostly with the network news anchoring that she did, but she also was on 2020 doing investigations into, for example, Dow Chemical manufacturing breast implants that were leaking into women's bodies. She did a uh, work into investigating a, a murder, a cold case murder done by members of the Ku Klux Klan in the 60s. Mm. And she looked back years later and was able to find through documentary evidence that actually the federal government could retry this case that had been a state case and actually was able to send this guy to prison who was responsible for the murder of a black man in uh, Mississippi, I believe. So, you know, looking at these sorts of things. You just, Connie Chung was obviously part of that. I also interviewed for the special issue Steve Scully, who was mm -hmm. a longtime political editor at C-SPAN and was actually going to host one of the presidential debates, moderate one of the presidential debates before Donald Trump got COVID. And he also said he was a newsboy at the time that Watergate was happening. And so he was yeah. obviously paying attention to all of this. And when you grow up in the shadow <laughs> of the Watergate investigation and seeing all the president's men, the book, and then the movie come out. It's hard not to have that affect the work that you're doing. So still to this day, right, even though we're 50 years after the break-in, there's a lot of prominent journalists who were informed so much, and even people like myself, you know, I'm in my 30s, and yet I grew up watching All the President's Men yeah, and yeah, hearing yeah. my parents talk about the day Nixon resigned and how impactful that was for their generation. And so it does continue to have influence. There's a lot of myth-making around that, which <laughs> W. Joseph Campbell tries to correct. And also John Dean, the White House counsel, when I interviewed him, he said that the depiction of some of this stuff in uh, All the President's Men borders on criminality because it's not really yeah, yeah, accurate. Yeah. Yeah. The movie's um, really bad that way, yeah. And so he said, you know, obviously you don't want to take anything away from Woodward and Bernstein and how they motivated so many people to become journalists and they are still role models today. And yet they themselves have said, we're not the ones who solely single-handedly took down a president. That's not our goal anyhow. You know, our goal yeah, is yeah, to expose yeah. what's happening, not to be politically motivated and say, we don't like this guy because he's part of the Republican Party and we're Democrats. And we that's not the goal of it. But I think what the special issue tries to do is correct the record on a lot yeah. of these points of Watergate, while also honoring it and saying that, you know, we're getting quickly to a generation like the students that Jerry and I are teaching who may not have any real knowledge of Watergate, right? No, Their parents no. are too young to have been around during Watergate themselves. You know, maybe they hear about it here and there, but a lot of students don't know anything about President Nixon and Woodward and Bernstein and all that. And I think it's important to remind them at least of the the impact that journalism can make and then bring into the picture all these other great investigative journalists throughout right, history right. who weren't named Woodward and Bernstein to show that you can still do this today too. Well, and I think one of the things that that really was, must drive you folks crazy was when Obama gave Woodward and Bernstein the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he said, 
something like, if it weren't for you two, this, I'm paraphrasing, if it weren't for you two, this wouldn't have happened. This was because two, and only two, investigative journalists started this, it wouldn't stop. And I was just screaming at the TV. And uh, I wish I had known at that time to scream, ecosystem, ecosystem, because that's that's obviously what we should talk about. So is it fair to say, if we don't want to uh, heroicize Woodward and Bernstein as the two people who did this, is it fair to say the ecosystem was the hero in all this? Yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, W. Joseph Campbell talks about this all the time. And in his his work in our journal, he talks about all the president's men and Washington Post claims that they ultimately precipitated Nixon's resignation and that that's not really true. And you need to look at all the different people they were talking to, their sources, Mm -hmm. other journalists who were following their lead, the editors who supported them. And as we said, all of these other people who then held the Senate Watergate committee hearings to investigate this more closely, to keep bringing this in public attention, to have these hearings on television so Mm. that everybody is stopping what they're doing in a time when we don't have streaming services and social media and all these other sort of media distractions of today, where everyone's stopping what they're doing and watching, you know, at, at yeah, Capitol yeah. Hill, them talk about all the terrible things that Nixon and his administration did. I mean, um, that you know, absolutely we, happened. That, you know, people stopped and watched. And if that was not happening, if it was only the stories in the Washington Post, who knows what kind yeah. of an impact that would have eventually made. But you you definitely need that. And I think it's it's worth reflecting on how things have changed today and how any sort of an investigation seems to be viewed as politically motivated and that you cannot really undertake any sort of, you know, even what might seem a, a relatively innocuous investigations, if investigations could be termed that way, but just a relatively straightforward one uh, without right. someone criticizing you and becoming hostile to you on social media, journalists facing death threats and being fearful of going out in public and making their social media you know silent, taking down pages because they're afraid of people contacting them. So I think there's a lot to kind of look at there. And when journalists feel that they are supported by elected official, mm-hmm, Adam Schiff mm-hmm. talks about this in the interview that we did for the journal, you know, when they feel supported by elected officials, then they feel a little bit more confident about it's what I'm doing is not wrong. I'm not politicizing it. I'm just doing shoe leather reporting to get information out there to enter into the conversation. Well, it, this show couldn't be more perfect. I wanted to delve in. I wanted to have some people on who could really delve into this much more deeply. And also as a 19th century person, all the granted 19th century Britain and 19th century US, we got to hear the 19th century origins of this stuff. So I couldn't be happier and I hope our listeners really like the show. So it just remains for me to say thank you to both of you, Dr. Hershon, for, th- for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Linoska, for coming on. Thank you. I hope that bo- you'll co- both come back on the show. You know, we, we, we love doing these types of topics. Yeah, that would be great. And just for all your listeners to know, you can go to the American Journalism website. A lot of the components of this special issue are behind a paywall, as is typical of academic journal. Although I imagine a lot of your listeners are faculty or graduate students who would have access mm-hmm. to this <laughs> through their university library. But we're also making several articles of it paywall free. So anyone can just go on the website and be able to find it. So you just Google American journalism, you'll find our website. And I'll be tweeting out all this stuff too, and snippets from the interviews that I did with Jane Seymour and Connie Chung and John Dean from my Twitter account at Nick Hershon. So hope that people will take a chance to read all of those. Well, we're also going to put these links on the Buzzkill blog post for this episode. So that should help a lot as well. Again, thank you both for coming on. And we'll say to all the Buzzkillers out there, We'll talk to all of you next week.